All right. Hello and good evening. Uh, before I begin, I would like to point out that we have ASL interpretation tonight. Uh, and if you'd like to use that service, you are encouraged now to pin our ASL interpreter. Uh, she's listed as ASL interpreter Mocktel, Kayla Mocktel, uh, to your Zoom feed. My name is Davin Waite, and I'm the communications manager with the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County. Uh, if you're tuned in tonight, you have found our program with Darcy Ashey called What is a Refugee? Uh, and it is offered in conjunction with our current exhibition at the MCOM Center, uh, Forced to Flee. Before we begin, uh, I'd also like to thank you for joining us. We view these digital lectures, these Zoom talks uh, at HCSCC as central to our efforts to preserve and share the history and culture of Clay County, Minnesota. So we appreciate your interest uh, and your help in that effort. Secondly, if you have any questions tonight, please type them into the Zoom chat section uh, or the Facebook comment section of the webcast, depending on how you're tuning in. Uh, we will hold a moderated Q&A session at the end, uh, and Darcy will address those questions and comments then. Our speaker tonight, Darcy Ashey, uh, was a volunteer with her local church during a period of refugee resettlement, uh, starting with refugees from Poland, Ethiopia, and Vietnam. She continued volunteering with other churches to promote refugee sponsorships. She then joined Lutheran Social Services in 1994 uh, and worked there for 20 years in community development before serving as the refugee coordinator for the state of North Dakota. She works now with the New American Consortium for Wellness and Empowerment, helping to assist refugees with long-term needs in North Dakota and Minnesota. Tonight, she will explore how refugees have fit into our communities uh, especially right here in the Red River Valley, and how we might work to build even stronger communities with our refugee neighbors. So with that, Darcy, uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Davin, and thank you for everyone joining us here tonight. Um, I would like to just kind of start out what brings me here as your uh, speaker tonight. I was invited to uh, be interviewed for the Force to Flee exhibit, the quilt exhibit that's currently um, on display at the Yomcom Center. And this was by Prairie Public Television. And so uh, my in interview time was 9.30 in the morning. So I, I drove into Fargo and went to the Yomcom and they were setting up and getting ready for me. And uh, the setup took like an hour after I, I, I had arrived. And so I was given time to uh, check out the, the exhibit. And I went around it the first time and had my initial reaction. And then I still had more time. So I went around it again and I read all the placards and the stories about the, uh, the, the um, artists and, and, you know, what what their quilt was portraying. And um, I started to get a little uncomfortable actually about kind of what I was going to be interviewed about, but I stuck to my interview. And um, this pre presentation has been scheduled for a really long time. Uh, who are refugees? What is a refugee? Um, I've worked with the Young Comps for years with the Pangea Project and um, I thought this is an opportunity as I was reflecting back on, on the quilt exhibit and my life as a resettlement coordinator to really um, share with you some of, some of my, um, my thoughts, my, my changing thoughts. And so I'm going to uh, start out by playing a video that I, um, you can all find it on, on YouTube. We use it a lot when we're talking about who are refugees and, um, and why are they fleeing.
shark. You only run home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. And the boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factories, holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. And even then, you carry the anthem under your breath only tearing up your passport in airport toilets, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you would not be going back. You have to understand, no one would put their children in a boat unless the sea is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains, beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the gallbladder of a truck feeding on newspaper unless the miles traveled means something more than journey. No one crawls under fences, wants to be beaten, wants to be pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire and one prison guard in the night is safer than 14 men who look like your father. No one could take it, could stomach it. No one's skin would be tough enough to go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country dry, niggers with their hands out, they smell strange, savage, messed up their own country, and now they want to mess up ours? How do the words, dirty looks, roll off your back? And maybe it's because the blow is softer than a limb torn off, or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs, or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone, than your child's body in pieces. I want to go home. But home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of a gun. And no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore. Unless home told you to quicken your legs. Leave your clothes behind. Crawl through the desert. Wade through the oceans. Drown. Save. Be hungry. Beg. Forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home unless home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave, run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. Home is an eight. Jam mint in her poem. The poem has no rhyme scheme or set meter. She writes right. purpose in writing. Trying to figure out how to this off. Uh... Right. I get a little emotional when I see that even for the thousandth time. Um, so we'll just start. What is a refugee forced to flee? The definition of a refugee adopted by the convention relating to the status of refugees in Geneva in 1951 is a person who owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for a reason of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion is outside the country of his nationality and is unable to return to it. There are currently estimated 85 million displaced people in the world today. In the 2021 fiscal year, our arrivals of refugees to the United States are lowest in history, less than 15,000. Projected numbers for fiscal year 20, 
2022 are 125,000, the highest number since 2010. North Dakota received approximately 30 refugee individuals in fiscal year 2021. Minnesota received 268 refugees in fiscal year 21. The largest number come from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Burma, and Somalia. So this is the confession of a former resettlement coordinator. I've always hung my hat on that definition that was written so very long ago, 1951, that was before I was born, of who is a refugee. And this exhibit that I was privileged to spend some time with, the forced to flee exhibit of the quilts has made me rethink a little bit about who I think and what I think is the definition of the word refugee. So how about we examine all the reasons that people leave their homes? Persecution, yes, of course, that's, that's number one, but there's war internal and external. There's natural disaster, earthquakes, floods, fire, drought. Natural disasters caused by climate change, rising oceans, and then extreme poverty. People that, need, that suffer persecution and are needing asylum should be given protection by whichever country they are in, irrespective of race, religion, ethnicity, or place, or country of origin. A Pupo nation is one where people are afraid that there isn't enough for me and you, so I'm getting mine because who cares about you? A great nation is filled with people who know that there is enough for people who are generous, and courageous and hopeful. A compassionate nation is filled with people and policies which are patient, kind, loving, joyful, peaceful, faithful, and gentle. This is a ship full of refugees fleeing Northern Africa across the Mediterranean headed towards Greece and Italy. Many of those boats never make it and many of those that are seeking escape are lost at sea. Nelson Mandela said that the power of imagination created the illusion that my vision went much farther than the naked eye could actually see. Looking back at 2020, what our eyes actually saw was a world where the sheer number of displaced people fleeing violence, poverty and oppression overwhelmed our capacity to com comprehend the misery of so many. In the face of so much despair, countries around the world were shutting their doors to those seeking sanctuary in a global movement of xenophobia that saw the stranger as a threat. In our own country, the US government reduced the refugee admission ceiling to a historic low of 15,000 stranding tens of thousands of people who would normally be offered a safe future in America, including family members of people who are already living here and have been waiting for years for them to join them. Anti-immigration policies were accompanied by anti-immigrant narrative that belied our history as a nation built by immigrants. The global pandemic seemed like the final blow, yet the power of our imagination let us see beyond the naked eye to put back together what was torn apart one life at a time. USCRI staff and partners responded to new challenges with imagination and resilience. Each one of our clients, the refugees, the unaccompanied migrant children, the survivors of human trafficking, were served in creative and resourceful ways. I didn't want to do that.
the first recognition of the life of every man is sacred as the first and only basis of all ethics. War is so unjust and ugly that all who wage it must try to stifle the voice of conscience within themselves. So what I'm suggesting tonight as I share this with you and my thoughts is can we redefine, can we, can we serve migrants with humanity rather than violence, um, sending people back to where they can't, they can't live, they can't raise their families in, in peace. And um, I would like to have a discussion at the end of this, um, but I would also like to read a poem by Wendell Berry that I found a long time ago. Wendell had taken his grandchildren to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC and um, wrote this for them after they exited the building. Now you know the worst we humans have to know about ourselves and I am sorry, for I know that you will be afraid. To those of our bodies given without pity to be burned, I know there is no answer but loving one another, even our enemies, and this is hard. But remember when a man of war becomes a man of peace, he gives light divine. So it is also home when a man of peace is killed by a man of war, he gives a light. You do not have to walk in darkness. If you will have the courage for love, you may walk in light. It will be the light of those who have suffered for peace. It will be your light. When a stranger sojourners with you, sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. The stranger who sojourns with you shall be to you as the native among you and you shall love him as yourself. Life is very short and there's no time for fighting and fussing, my friends. So I am um, suggesting that we look at ways that we can respond to migrants of all types, not just those that fit the legal definition of a refugee as I presented earlier, but how can we, how can we support and, and welcome and provide a sense of belonging to those who um, will be joining us in our community, for example, um, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services in Fargo will be receiving approximately 50 Afghan refugees in fiscal year 2022. Can we reach out to that organization and ask how we can help, what they need? Um, they are no longer affiliated with, with Lutheran Social Services because of the loss of that organization. And so they're seeking new ground um, doing this as a sub office of a national organization. And so um, I'm sure that they would be very responsive to a, a call for volunteers or for material goods or for financial donations for people. Um, also, I would suggest supporting the local groups who are, are working with refugees, um, both locally and internationally. Those who are have formed um, by ethnic groups that have been resettled into our communities, the Somalis, the Iraqis, uh, the Congolese, the Bhutanese, they all have organizations that um, provide tr transportation, help fill out forms, make, make appointments, um, explain the, the crazy systems that they're going to be currently living under and um, reaching out to them and supporting them in any way, volunteering with them, helping people learn English. Um, and we can nationally support organizations that are serving on the border. I'm uh, very uh, 
familiar with the border situation, having, having led several delegations from the north to the Texas-Mexico border and visiting detention centers and shelters and um, churches that serve and um, meeting and hearing the stories of people who have migrated across the Rio Grande. Um, and they are responding right now to a, a surge of migrants from the South, everywhere from Central America to Mexico, to people who have used Mexico as a gateway to the US border from around the world. I um, actually was stopped at the border once because my friend jokingly said that I was Norwegian and um, the border patrol set, demanded that I prove that I actually was a US citizen, fortunately. <laughs> I had my documents with me, but um, yes, even people from um, Europe use the southern border to cross to get into the United States. Um, UNHCR USA is located in on the East Coast, and um, you can check them out on the on the internet, on the web, and find ways that they can that you can support them. They are also asking for um, support. They have ten underfunded responses for 2021, which include um, COVID relief for for people that are um, in refugee camps and who are migrating. Um, Iraq, the Iraq refugees, refugees from Iraq, millions of Iraqis have been forced to flee their homes after decades of conflict. Many refugees, returnees, and internationally displaced people are facing bitterly cold winters in substandard shelters. In Syria, as with the Iraqi emergency, winters a big concern with displaced Syrians and refugees alike. With global gas shortages, providing warmth is our top concern. In South Sudan, many of um, our friends and neighbors are from that area. Brutal conflict in South Sudan has claimed thousands of lives and driven nearly 4 million people, mostly women and children, from their homes. At the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, an estimated 5 million people fled the DRC between 2017 and 2019. And while many have now returned, they still face widespread human, viola human rights violations. Um, in Nigeria, Boko Haram insurgency in Nigeria and the Lake Chad Basin has caused widespread sexual and gender-based violence, forced the recruitment and suicide bombings. Um, you may have read about, you know, hundreds of, of girls that have been kidnapped from, from schools. Drought and natural hazards in Somalia have compromised how difficult life in Somalia is after two and a half decades of armed conflict in the country. In Myanmar, since 2017, the Rohingya have been forced to leave Myanmar at a staggering rate. Many of the 742,000 refugees are residing in flood-prone Bangladesh. In Venezuela, around 5.4 million people have escaped violence, insecurity, and threats, as well as lack of food. Medicine and essential services are also needed in Venezuela. And in Burundi, after violent political unrest, the people of Burundi are facing a humanitarian crisis marked by economic decline, extreme food insecurity, and disease outbreak. These are the top 10 underfunded programs of UNHCR USA. And USCRI, which um, is an organization that I've been with, familiar with for, for 25 years, um, works both nationally and internationally. And um, part of my presentation that I read was from the CEO of, of um, USCRI, Eskander. Eskander was a refugee himself from Ethiopia. He was also um, under Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, the Director of Office of Refugee Resettlement. 
Um, that is an appointed position. And so after um, the Obama administration left, he became the CEO of USCRI. This personally is an organization that I plan to seek out to see how we can start conversations about humanitarian response to migrants at our own border. Uh, for years, I've looked over at um, you know, what has happened in Greece, what happens in Australia when people are fleeing their homes and getting in boats and, and um, taking to the ocean to escape uh, you know, the, the terrible lives that, that they are um, running away from. And thinking about our own resettlement and how we meet our, our clients at the airport and they arrive with very little in their hands. Um, and sometimes it all looks hopeless. And then all of a sudden, five years later, their kids are going to college and they're buying a house and they've got cars and they've got <laughs> great jobs and they're contributing to the community. And they're reaching back to you know, friends and relatives where that they left behind that they um, that haven't been able to join them in the United States and, um, and just wanting to see that kind of response again of, of going from 15,000 numbers of refugees accepted into the country back to numbers closer to the 125,000. Um, it's going to take a lot of work nationally to rebuild that network that did the resettlement in the past. It was what I considered a pretty well-oiled machine. And it was slowly and methodically dismantled and now needs to be rebuilt. And so people in the community, people that care, um, you know, can really be a part of, of helping make that happen. And we also need to be educated about why it is that people are leaving their, their country. I, and, you know, I think that the video at the beginning of this presentation could give you a good sense of, um, the, of the heart and mind of people that are fleeing their homes. But to um, learn, about the, learn about the Afghan refugees who are coming, who are they? Why, why, are they um, why are they coming here? Why are they coming to North Dakota or Minnesota? And then just, I would challenge you to think differently. And I say that as a um, recovering resettlement <laughs> coordinator who's been bound by a 1951 uh, definition of the word refugee. And I want to be thinking about that in a much broader sense so that we can help put those systems in place so that we can provide a humanitarian response to it. It doesn't necessarily mean opening our borders wide to people, but not having them living under bridges and not having water or food or blankets or any, um, any hope after, after their journey and, um, and how and how can we make that who we are instead of who we look like we've become? So, Davin, I will take questions at this time. All right, hey, Darcy. Hello. By the way. I would encourage you all to spend some time with this forced to flee quilt exhibit. It is just, it's just amazing. Um, I'll just share a little story when I was being interviewed after I'd walked around the exhibit a couple of different times and really looked at it very closely, um, was sitting in front of a, of a quilt that really was kind of um, not that, outstanding to me, I guess. And all of a sudden I saw in it the imprints of boots, sort of like batik onto the fabric. And it 
And it um, brought tears to my eyes as it reminded me of a place that I had visited in, in um, Brownsville, Texas, that was a, a shelter for people who had been released from, from detention, but were still awaiting their, their asylum hearings. And there was a chapel that had been set up there. Somebody had built like a three-dimensional cross from chicken wire. And inside of that frame covered by chicken wire were the shoes that were recovered from the desert in, the, in Mexico from migrants who had walked across the desert towards the border. And um, the question was, who, are, who were these people? Some of them were women's shoes. Some of them were children's shoes. There were boots. Who were they? Did they ever make it across the border? Do their families know where they are? Or are those shoes in that cross just the only thing that's, um, that's left behind for us to contemplate what happened to them? So sorry, Davin. Now we can oh, take. Oh, that was great. Uh, got a couple questions here. Um, so I guess we'll we'll start with this one. So you you've already listed some organizations, uh, including USCI or CRI. CRI, United States Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. And, and you mentioned some other local organizations. I'm wondering if you would just. Um, uh, throw out a few more of those names for uh, organizations that are helping uh, refugees who live right here in, you know, Fargo, Moorhead, or Cass and Clay counties. Um, there's the Afro American uh, Association that is uh, that serves a lot of the Somali families. They have English language classes. They provide transportation. Um, they've been really active during COVID. Um, making videos and um, meeting people and reassuring them about um, the, the immunizations, for example, encouraging them to wear masks, keeping them up to date with the constantly changing information. Um, the South Sudanese organization serves, the, um, serves Sudanese in Fargo and Moorhead. Um, they do a lot of after school tutoring for kids. Uh, they they um, have women's empowerment programs. Uh, there's also the Bhutanese Association of North Dakota, who um, they, they, a lot of their um, a lot of their work is around organizing um, gatherings. We don't have a temple in our area, and so for them to go and um, celebrate their festivals, which by the way, it's it's uh, festival season right now for our Bhutanese neighbors uh, to the end of the year. Um, we just had Deshar. And um, so, uh, and, and they're also very active in the summertime with outdoor recreation for adults and kids like soccer. Um, the Kurdish, community that is uh, located in Moorhead is very active in working with their with their um, the Kurdish refugees that have been here for a while. They do community gardening. Um, and also um, always we have a little bit of English language learning in there. New American Consortium um, serves all of dif the different ethnic communities, uh, including um, immigrants, not just those that came as refugees. So um, Spanish speaking individuals, uh, anybody coming from uh, as, uh, I don't know if you guys know what a diversity visa is, but um, when somebody applies for a diversity visa, they are allowed to come into the United States, but they are absolutely not eligible for any kind of public um, services. So they're really reaching out for um, direction and where to go, you know, for housing and uh, health care and all of those things. They, they just kind of come um, on their own. I've met with people that have come with diversity visas 
and just like, oh my God, for all the places in the United States that you could go, why would have you chosen Moorhead, Minnesota? And the answer is always, I did my research. <laughs> and there's low crime and there's lots of job opportunities and education is outstanding. And that's why my family came here. So serving, um, serving diversity visa holders is, is pretty, uh, pretty fun. Um, we also do serve um, victims of human trafficking. We've um, served individuals that have been labor trafficked that are brought into the United States with promises of green cards, which is not a possibility actually. Um, but they, um, we have farm workers that have um, that we've served. We have um, oil field pipe fitters and um, many others, uh, restaurant workers, uh, people that work in um, nail salons, for example. And um, so across the other side of the, of the river in Fargo, of course, um, as I mentioned, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services has a sub office. Um, there's uh, the Somali community of North Dakota that serves a, a you know kind of a well-established Somali population, um, and then you know actually one of the you know some good places to really reach out for if you're interested in helping um, people with their education is the adult learning centers in Moorhead, Fargo, and West Fargo. They're always looking for volunteers for their English language learning students. So the, the possibilities are endless. All right. Um, we got a question here. Um, you know, you're, you're talking a bit tonight because there's this uh, exhibition at the Yemcom Center, Forced to Flee. Um, and, you know, you started your presentation with uh, a poem from, uh, sorry, was it Warsan Shire? Wars Is that right? Yeah, Shiri. Warsan Shiri. Shiri. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so art plays a, a big role in, you know, personalizing and humanizing these stories uh, that are often just uh, I think we can agree, presented sort of uh, fearfully in, in news reports. Um, have you found, you know, books or movies that that help, you know, that do that do the refugee experience justice, you know, that might offer a bit more nuance than we'll see in 30 second news clips? Um, you know, uh, yes. <laughs> Um, a few of my favorites, um, um, boy, I wish you would, I wish I would have known this was kind of, I have a terrible time remembering, um, movie right. names, sorry. Um, of course, sometime in April is a, a terrifying story of what happened in Rwanda. Um, it tells a much more graphic story than um, Hotel Rwanda, um, really from the perspective of, of the people that um, lived and died through it. Um, there's a lot of books. Uh, we have local authors that have written books like Letizia Mazzaro um, has written a couple of of books recently. Um, boy, um, I'd have to put, give you a list. I would, um, I know that when we've done Pangea, Davin, we've asked the, the Fargo Public Library and the Moorhead Library to put together reading lists for us. Um, and so there's, there's those books. Also, we have an exhibit at our office, um, The World in Fargo Moorhead which is uh, portraits of people who um, live in our community um, and, and a little story about each one of them, what brings them here. Um, and then we also have a second exhibit that was recently donated to us by Meg Lindholm um, that she did back in the late 1990s. 
um, at Cardinal IG. She took photos of the um, employees there, which is really, it's really beautiful. We have it hanging on our wall and we're everybody that walks in, you know, kind of picks out a favorite image that, um, that hits them, you know, kind of in the, in the heart. And um, one of the things that was wonderful for me working in the resettlement, um, we were just starting to resettle refugees from Africa. That was pretty new. Um, and so it was really changing the landscape of, of um, the landscape, meaning, you know, what people looked like that lived in our community. And there was a lot of backlash to it. And um, Meg had just done this on her own. It was a project that she was doing um, as part of her master's. And she had read something about Cardinal IG wanting to um, or reaching out and, and um, employing a lot of people that had come as refugees. And so she um, approached the, the owner and said, you know, can I do a, to, can I take, come in and take photos? And it became a very powerful tool for us doing resettlement to kind of change the narrative on people coming as refugees and being on assistance and not wanting to work. And, um, and it showed them working in a very uh, demanding workplace um, with very positive feedback from their employer. So I would invite anybody to come to the WE Center um, and you can check those exhibits out. They also have been um, part of Pangea in the past. Um, so that, that's my suggestion. Um, <laughs> Movies, I can't think of the names of them, but uh, Sometime in April has definitely stuck with me for a really long time. Um, I had used, I've used clips of movies when I've done presentations. Um, so one of them is, um, oh my gosh, I can't think of the name, Davin, help me. It's the um, diamond one in Congo. Oh. Is, wait, is it Blood Diamond with Leo DiCaprio? Thanks, That's Blood it? Diamond. Okay. There is a scene in that movie where people are just going about their daily business and all of a sudden the tanks roll into town with the, with the um, soldiers and um, people are forced to run for the, for the outskirts of town and families are separated. Um, children in schools go one way Mom's at home with the babies go another way. Dad's at work go a third way. And, um, and then it shows sort of the agony of searching for each other in kind of the bush and, um, you know, families behind fences. And um, so, yeah, Blood Diamond, it's, uh, that, that is like one of the more powerful scenes of really what um, a lot of the people that are become refugees have experienced in the blink of an eye. Okay. Um, and then I, I think, let me check to see if there's been any more. Um, finally, I'll, I'll, I'll combine this one. Um, uh, we got questions about uh, how long refugees have been resettled in Fargo Moorhead. And I, I think you touched on that briefly at the beginning, uh, but I'm wondering if you could add a little more to that. Uh, and, um, oh, sorry. sorry. Second, second part, go for it. Sure. Uh, and then uh, secondly, uh, whether or not, um, you know, more refugees are resettled in the Midwest than other areas of the U.S. Now, do we have data on that? There's data. There's some data all over the place. Okay, so um, the first refugee came to North Dakota um, in 1946. And, um, and, and refugees, you know, were pretty, were, were, were being resettled, um, especially through the Lutheran church. Um, so if you, uh, uh, there's a, there's another movie, Clint Eastwood, I remember the actor. Um, it's, and the name of the movie is a type of car. This is a trivia. This has helped me pick the names of these movies out sure, of my sure. brain. <laughs> I think you might be talking about Gran Torino. You are so correct. Yay. All right. Okay. Um, 
he uh, he has a couple of young um, people in his pickup and he goes like, how did you people get here anyway? And um, the answer is the Lutherans brought us. And believe me, the Lutherans thought that was, you know, very funny because the Lutherans kind of were the ones that um, kind of got this whole resettlement going after World War II. Um, so our first refugees in North Dakota were 1946. Um, most of them were coming out of uh, so former Soviet Union, Poland, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the numbers are, are um, designated by the president every year in October. And they, they break the numbers out into different regions with, uh, with a sort of unallocated number. I think the unallocated number for 2022 is 10,000. So that's so that we can respond to any sort of new um, thing that's happening in the world that you know happens within that 12 month period of time. Um, it, when I first started resettling refugees, the entire continent of Africa was given probably about 1500 individual slots each year, which was ridiculous in my mind because they were the largest refugee um, producing area in the world. And that all changed um, during the George Bush Jr. Um, Jr., George, whatever, um, era, he increased that number to about 8,000, which came, which put it you know, on par where it really should have been. And um, the numbers have the, at the highest were probably uh, during the Bill Clinton administration. And, you know, so we were at like maybe 150 to 175,000 per year. And then, um, and that was a goal. So the goal was 175 to 180,000 refugees that would be resettled into the United States in a fiscal year. And then the definition changed to um, uh, uh, not a ceiling. So it was no longer a goal, but it was a ceiling. And so what that, what that meant is if we allocated 100,000 slots, but we only resettled 35,000, it was okay. We hadn't met, we hadn't, you know, gone above the ceiling. And it started to sort of change the perspective of people, I think. I mean, we had arguments with um, local governments um, because we would go 10 individuals over what we had said was our goal for the year, you know, 10 people. And all of a sudden, you know, it was on the news and we had gone over our, our you know, our, our numbers. And, um, and so the language started to sort of deteriorate the, the goodwill, I think, of, of a lot of people. Yeah, Minnesota is um, actually one of the top resettlement states in the United States. Um, the question about the Midwest versus other parts of the country, uh, we don't even compare. We're not even close to Texas and Florida and the East Coast and um, California. Um, they resettle refugees in the thousands or have in the past um, every year. And um, like I said, Minnesota is up there in the top 10, but um, it doesn't, and, and, and it's a, in a, in a sense, it, it's kind of a negative for us because we're not competitive with like federal grants and so forth that we, they don't even consider North Dakota because our numbers are so low. Um, and we've been fighting that for a long time. It's like, you know, can you have like a less than, you know, 2000 and a greater than 2000 category. So it doesn't always go to the same, to the same cities and to the same states. Okay. Um, got a lot of comments here. Thanking you for your talk, telling you good job. So I'll pass those on as well. Um, and with that, uh, we're going to end tonight's talk. Um,
Uh, as Darcy mentioned earlier, uh, we do have an exhibition at the MCOMP Center, uh, HCSCC does, uh, called Forced to Flee. Uh, it captures refugee experiences through the medium of art quilts. Um, it's very interesting, and as Darcy's mentioned, it's powerful. Um, to check that out, to learn how you can check it out, or to uh, learn more about HCSCC, also, please visit us online at www.hcsconline.org. Have a good night. And thank you, Darcy. Thank you guys for your attention. Thanks, Devin. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks.